and tell them we're in Paulson. Okay, folks, the battery is dead in the wireless mic, which I think is a prerequisite. My, my trusted assistant will make sure that we do get the battery. Okay, let's get started. So this was a busy weekend, I could see, for some of you at least. I, you know, I got probably 200 emails over the weekend. Most about the project, which is good because this was a good weekend to work on the project, which means that those of you who did not work on the project, it's a weekend lost, right? Because next weekend, of course, is the weekend before the next quiz, and which is bad news. The next quiz is coming, but I have some good news. In fact, I think that by the end of today's session, we will be done with the material for the set for the third quiz. So, no. So let's let's. Um, now let, let me let me start off with a couple of points about the project. One is that email I sent to you yesterday about you know geographical break, breakdown. I mean we have to you know there is some information we'd like companies to provide us that we don't have, but you have to work with what you have. And companies are not very good about breaking down geographically their revenues. I think these should be better. In fact, if I were writing disclosure laws, this is one of the things I would emphasize because we need more information about not just where your revenues come from, but where your operations are. I'd like to know what percentage of Microsoft software is written in India. Not because I'm just curious, but because to value a company, I need to know what risks it's exposed to. But work with what you have. You, I mean, you can wish that you had better information, but this is all you have. The second issue I want to talk about, and this is an issue that came up in about 20 or 25 of the emails, is an issue of time consistency. Do not be a slave to time consistency. And here's what I mean by that. When you sit down and collect information about your company, some of it is going to come from accounting statements, some of it is going to come from the market, right? Stock price. And almost by definition, the market data is going to be much more updated than the accounting data. For some of you, the accounting data, especially if you're using 10Ks or annual reports, might still be 2010 information, because the 2011 information is just starting to come out, or it's, you know, it's in the process of coming out. So it might be that across your six companies, three of your companies, the information is through the third quarter of 2011, three of your companies, it's updated through the end of 2011, and for all of your companies, the market data is going to be much more recent than any of the accounting data. And that I know troubles some of you, that you're being inconsistent. But let me resolve that inconsistency. Here's the rule. Thank you. Here's the rule on every issue. Oh, there you go. Here's the rule on every input. On every input in corporate finance, you're looking for the most updated information you can on that input. So if I ask you what the risk-free rate was, I'm not asking you what the risk-free rate was on December 31st of 2010 or 2011. I don't care. I want the risk-free rate today. When I ask you what the operating income for your company is, I'd like to get the operating income through yesterday. But unfortunately, the most recent data you have is accounting data, so you're going to end up giving me the operating income from the most recent 12 months, the most recent year. So you are being consistent, even though the time might not match up, this is the most updated information you have on this input. And that's the way the world works. If you're doing evaluation of a company, some information is going to be a little more dated than others, but you're going to have to work with that information as it is today. Okay, so keep working on the project. You're, uh, you know, you're closer to the end than you realize. It looks like looking forward, you have lots of stuff to do. But if you can get the capital structure section done, you're actually about 70% through the project, or 75% through the project. So try to get that optimal capital structure done as soon as you can, which is a good launching pad for today's session. Let's go back and review where I left you at the end of the last session. We talked about your company's actual being different from the optimal, right? It's under levered or over levered. We talked about a framework about what to do next. And the question we're asking, both cases, both under levered and over levered, is how much time do I have to fix this problem, right? If you're under levered, what were you worried about? What was the thing that was hanging over your head? You have too little debt. 
that somebody might take you over. So you ask the question, am I too, too large to be taken over? Do I have time? So you're trying to assess whether you need to fix this quickly. If you're over levered, the question you're asking is, am I going to go bankrupt? And if there's urgency right over the issue, then you've got to do something quickly. So here's what I want to start with today. I want to start with what to do if your company looks like it's in danger of being taken over or going bankrupt, how you can fix the debt ratio quickly. Let's start with a pleasanter problem. If you have too little debt, here are some of the things you can do to bring your debt ratio up quickly. One is you can borrow money and buy back stock, right? That very quickly increases your debt ratio. Or you can sell assets. If you have assets that you want to get rid of anyway, you can sell those assets, use the cash to pay a special dividend or buy back stock. See, the net effect of this is your debt goes up, your equity comes down, your debt ratio will increase. Selling assets and paying a dividend or buying back stock brings down your equity. It'll work only if you have debt already on your books to bring your debt ratio up. If you, if you want to decrease your debt ratio, spelling is way off that. If I want to decrease the debt ratio, then I, it, it gets a little more difficult. I have to issue new stock to raise equity, to pay down debt, and that's difficult because nobody likes me right now as a company. I'm in trouble. Okay. So Nokia, as you've probably been reading over the weekend, is having issues with its debt ratio. The CFO claims that there are no issues, but the CFOs always claim that. What, what else can they say? Right? But if they do have a problem with the debt ratio, it's not going to be easy for them to go out and issue shares because the stock price is now down to about $4 per share. And if they announce they're going to make a big stock issue, who knows where it's going to go next? So it's not easy for them to issue stock. You're saying, why can't they sell assets? Because everybody knows they're desperate. So if they offer some of their business for sale, they're not going to get more than 50 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar. So it's not easy to decrease your debt ratio. But if you have to do something quickly, you have no choice. So if you have to do something quickly, then your pathway gets a little more difficult in both scenarios. If you have time, as your ally, either because you're not under threat of takeover if you're under levered, or because you're not under bankruptcy threat if you're over levered, then you can try to devise longer term plans. A couple of issues here. One is the, the process by which you change your debt ratio is going to stay the same. You decrease equity either by paying dividends or buying back stock. You increase your or decrease debt by paying off debt, but you just do it over time. The one problem when you do it over time, and it's a mechanical problem is let's say you're at a 10% debt ratio. You want to get to 40%, but you're going to do it over five years. Your value today is a billion, right? So 100 million is debt, you want to get to 400 million, but that works only if you do it right away. If you do it over the next five years, that billion dollar value that, that you have for your company will probably change over time. Say, but I don't know how much it will change by. You actually do. Remember the cost of equity that you computed for your company? That is your expected rate of return from investing in the stock. So if you trust your cost of equity, you can actually tell me what your market value of equity will be one year from now, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now. With a 10% cost of equity, for instance, your $1 billion will be about $1.7 billion by the end of the fifth year. So to get to a 40% debt ratio over the next five years, you can't just shoot to for, for, for 400 million, you got to get all the way up to 700 million to get to that same debt ratio. So if you're going to devise a long-term plan to increase your debt ratio, you'll actually be borrowing a lot more money to get to that same debt ratio than doing it today. It's not a big issue, but it's something that's got to be brought into the process. So now let's complete the process here. So let's go back to that Disney case we were looking at. So the board of directors, Essentially, I argued to them that Disney had too little debt, right? They were under level. And then they had these questions, why should we do it? And I said, if you do it, your values of firm will increase by 1.7 billion. So what if something goes wrong? I said, don't worry, you have enough buffer built in that even if something goes wrong, you'll be okay. And then they said, what if we want to do projects? And I said, that's, that's okay too. If you want to just expand, build another theme park, expand ESP, and I can live with that, the 40% still works. Let's say at the end of those three questions, they're, they're, they're convinced that this is the right, way, right thing to do. They say, okay, you've sold us on borrowing more money. What type of debt should we use to finance our operations, to get to this higher debt ratio? It's at this stage in the process that many corporate finance people at investment banks, consulting firms, 
make a terrible mistake. You know what they say? That's not our job. Our product people will be out next week to talk to you and they leave. And they leave a vacuum. They leave. What does the CFO know? That he has excess debt capacity, right? You're not going to be back for a week. So you know what he's doing during that week? He's calling around. By the time your product people show up a week from now, the vacuum's already been filled. Somebody else is. You did all the dirty work of showing them that they're excess debt capacity and somebody else walks away with the spoils. Remember, you don't get paid for the advice. You got paid for the products that came out of the advice. So if somebody asks you what type of debt should we use, rise to the challenge. Tell them exactly the right kind of debt for them. And it's not difficult to do. So that's the question we're going to answer today. What is the right kind of debt for your company? I'm going to use Disney to kind of illustrate this process. But here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think about your company, your company for the project, and start doing the project while you're in class. Because as we go through these steps, think about designing the perfect debt for your company. To see what that perfect debt is, let's step back. What's the biggest advantage of borrowing money as opposed to using equity? What's the biggest advantage of debt? It's a tax advantage. Right? What's the biggest advantage of using equity? Flexibility. In case things go bad, you can hold back on your cash flows. You know what you'd like to issue? You'd like to issue a cross-dressing security. A security that behaves like debt with the IRS gets you your tax benefit and behaves like equity around you. You see the benefit of doing that? You get the tax benefits of debt and you get all of the advantages of equity. So let me set this up in the abstract and, and provide the argument for why matching debt up to your assets is a good idea. I don't know whether any of you got a chance to read that uh, article that I posted last night on Corskit, but if you get a chance, go look at it, because this is an article that's talking about how more and more companies are issuing debt where the payments are tied to how well the company is doing. In effect, they're, they're trying to do what we're talking about, issuing debt that behaves like equity. So let's suppose you have a firm, and the firm value goes up and down. Good things happen. So the, the dark line is the value of the firm. If this firm went out and issued straight debt, where nothing happened to the value of the debt across time, there are at least a couple of points in time where this firm is in serious trouble, right? The value of the firm falls below the outstanding debt. Technically, this company is bankrupt. You say, what's the big deal? That's the problem with borrowing money. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this company and replace this inflexible debt with debt that moves up and down with the firm value. That's my argument for flexible debt. If you have debt that goes up when the firm value is high and goes down when the firm value is low, this firm actually has 50% more debt than the previous firm, but it never goes bankrupt. That's what we're going to try to do in designing debt. We're going to try to design debt that behaves like equity. Okay? So let's start the process off. So think about the company sitting across the table from you. You've convinced them about their debt capacity. And they say, OK, what kind of debt should we use? Rather than tell them what's in your product, you know, product box, and say, this is the, these are the products we have, ask them a few questions. Here's the first question you should ask them. What is the typical duration of projects you take on as a company? Let's take a couple of examples. If you ask this of Boeing, What's the typical duration? How long term are your projects? What's the answer you're going to get? I mean, Boeing has about nine projects in its entire life. 707, 727, 737, 747, Dreamliner. And these projects are what, 50 year projects? Because it takes them about 15 years to do the research, about five years to iron out the kinks. And then once they start producing planes, they basically produce them for about 30 to 35 years. I think the last Jumbo, the 747, rolled off 35 years after the first one. So projects are really long term. So if you were advising Boeing on the right kind of debt for them, the right kind of debt for them should be really long term debt. Boeing was one of two companies in the late 90s that issued 100 year corporate bonds. You can see why, really long term projects, 100 year bonds. You know what the other company was? One, I said one or two. The other was Disney. We'll come back and talk about Disney, because Boeing, you can see why. Disney is a little more difficult to grapple with. Why would you issue 100-year bonds? 
Now, in contrast, let's suppose that you were advising Dell. So what's a typical project for Dell? It's probably more like a two to three year project in technology. You don't have a hundred year project. So the right kind of debt for pretty much any technology firm is going to be much more short term debt. So the first step in the process, what's the duration of a typical project? You say, what if my company doesn't have a typical project? It gets more difficult if your company is in five different businesses where the projects are different in each one. In fact, for Disney, that's exactly the problem I'm going to run into. What's a typical project for Disney? It could be an expansion of a theme park, which could be a really long-term project, or it could be producing a new TV show, which is a really short-term project. No one type of debt is going to work for both. So if you have a multi-business company, ask us about each type of business your company is in. Second question I'm going to ask is, what currency are your cash flows in? The answer is of Coca-Cola. Now the answer you're going to get is about 40% in US dollars, 60% in everything else. It's a multinational in the truest sense of the word. You say, why does that matter? When I look at the pie chart of your debt in terms of currencies, I should expect to see a pie chart for your debt that looks very much like the pie chart for your cash flows. If you get only 40% of your revenues in US dollars, I want to see only 40% of your debt be US dollar debt. You're already saying, but. Hold off on the buts, because right now we're designing the customized, the perfect one. Let's let the buts wait until we've, we've basically worked through the process. If your company is getting all of its revenues just in the US, I expect to see only dollar debt there. Third question I'm going to ask you, and this is going to sound like a strange question. We're going to see why I need the answer to that. I want to see how you deal with inflation. When inflation goes up, are you able to pass this inflation through to your customers? Do you have pricing power? You know what companies are pricing power? Companies with strong competitive advantages, brand names, loyal customers. You think, why does that matter? If you're able to pass inflation through to your customers, if you have pricing power, I think you're a much better candidate for floating rate debt. What's floating rate debt? What, how does it work again? The interest rates on the debt move up and down depending on what's happening to market interest rates, right? Whether it's a prime rate, the LIBOR, the 10-year the rate, it's tied to a market interest rate. And you know what the biggest driver of interest rates over time is? Inflation. So when inflation goes up, we know interest rates go up. You think, what's the big deal? If you don't have pricing power and you borrow using floating rate debt, you know what's going to happen to you? Inflation goes up, your interest payments are going to go up, but because you don't have pricing power to pass that inflation through, you're going to get squeezed. So companies that have pricing power are much better candidates for floating rate debt than companies that don't have pricing power. As I go through this list, I want you to think about your company. You know? What's the typical duration of my company's projects? What's the breakdown? Which already you started, right? When you did that geographic breakdown for where my revenues are, you're already starting to lay the foundations for what type of debt is right for you. And does my company have pricing power? And the, the third question might not be as easy to answer as the first two because you can't just look up the numbers. You might have to get a sense of what kind of company is this? What, are the, what do the competitors look like? Do I have strong barriers to entry? Fourth question I'm going to ask you. What kind of growth do you see in this company? If you're a mature company with very little growth in the future, then I think you're a much better candidate for fixed rate debt. I'm sorry, traditional straight debt, which is no, no features added on. If you're a company with a lot of growth in the future, then I think you're a much better candidate for convertible debt. Why is that? When you're a growth company, right now you have low cash flows, right? Not because you don't make money, but because a lot of the money goes back into the company. So when you borrow money, you'd like to have interest payments that are low right now. But as you grow, you're willing to make much higher interest payments. You know what the advantage of convertible debt for that company is? When you issue convertible debt, what are you doing? You're adding a conversion option on top of the debt and lowering the coupon rate on the debt. If you look at convertible debt, you'll see the coupon rate is 1%, 2%, not because it's really cheap, but because you've added that conversion option on. So if you're a growth company, you get the best of both worlds. You get to keep interest payments low right now when you can't afford them. And as you grow, guess what happens with convertible debt? It gets converted to equity, you replace it with straight debt. So if you're a growth company, you're a much better candidate for convertible debt. And the final question I'm going to ask you is tell me,
the rating might actually go up. But why were they over levered in the first place? They were having a tough time making the debt payments, right? Now, what have you done? You've added to those payments. You can pool the ratings agency, but that's not the end objective here. In fact, your only consolation prize will be is when you go bankrupt, you'll have a really good rate. So what are you going to do with it, right? I think, in a sense, we sometimes think that this is a joke. And companies fall into this, investment banks fall into this, that if you pool the ratings agency, you won the game. You won a skirmish. The game is a much bigger game. You have to survive as a company. And the fact is that ratings agencies no de don't determine whether you survive as a company. So if you are picking a group here, I pick the underlevered companies because they have the debt capacity. They can issue the trust preferred while keeping this arbitrary rating constraints in place. But the problem with ratings agencies is eventually they do catch up. So remember the early 90s? I said they treated trust preferred as equity. Eventually they started to learn that this is not really equity. So by the mid-90s, they were treating it as half debt, half equity. And by the late 90s, they were treating it almost entirely as debt. All you needed was one company to go bankrupt with trust preferred in the record. Oh my God, this is great. You think that will end the game, right? But this is an ongoing game. Once they caught on to trust preferred, the next generation of investment bankers said, let's create something even more complex to pool the ratings agency. I mean, it, it's just, if, you, if you think about it, what you're doing is you're trying to create degrees of separation between the company and its own debt. So trust preferred is like two degrees of separation. Each new security, you add another layer of separation. And the end result of doing this, of course, is if you join this, is you get Enron. We all heard the Enron story. And everybody's convinced that Enron was run by crooks, and maybe it was. But I'm convinced that in 1999, at the peak of Enron's glory, if you'd walked into Andy Fastow's office and asked him, how much money does your company owe? How much do you owe? That he wouldn't have known the answer. You think that's a dangerous thing for a, com for a business, to not know how much you owe? But that's what happens when you create so many degrees of separation between you and your own debt that you don't know how much you borrowed. Maybe there's some variation of this thing. Nobody else told you it's really poor. Let me, let me change that question a little bit. If you borrow money and nobody knows you borrowed money, have you borrowed money? There's one person who knows, right? You know who knows? The person who lent you the money. That's really what we need to keep in mind is hiding debt from the ratings agency might give you a higher rating, but eventually that debt has to be paid. So my advice to you is if you, are, if you get involved in this process of designing complex security, I want you to think of it as a joke. But you've got to step back and remember the first principles of Philip Pratt. In other words, you're going to create complexity, do it with a purpose. Keep in mind that you still have to make these payments, because at least then you can have good sense stop you from doing something incredibly sophisticated. So let's see where we are. You've designed the perfect bond. You've got the Pratt Code Book. And you've got these different groups with varying different interests. Maybe they're not sharing with you, but saying it's okay. You can live with it. The next step in the process is you get ready to issue the debt. And you realize that nobody will buy your bond. And why not? For one of two reasons. You've never issued bonds before. And they don't trust you. The bond market is a very different market than the equity market. The first time around. Or you've issued bonds before and you have the wrong kind of person. I'll give you a story. This is the Nabisco example I talked about, the Nabisco fiasco in 1986 when they did the LBO and they left all these bondholders holding empty stacks of paper. KKR took Nabisco private for about five years and then took it back public in the early 90s. So Nabisco is now back to being a public company. It decides to make a bond issue and issue bonds. And of course, nobody would buy their bonds. You know why, right? Because they remember what happened five years ago. So if you're a company with the wrong kind of issue, you might not be able to issue bonds. Why? Because nobody trusts you. You know what you might have to do? You might have to sugarcoat this bond, add features to it to convince people that you're not going to rip them off. Let me give you a couple of examples of how you might be able to do this. Post Nabisco, Merrill Lynch and Sweet 
member bonds. You know why I asked for the conversion feature? Because as the person buying the bond, who is ripping you off? It's the equity investors, right? So you know what your threat to them was? You try to rip me off too much, I'll become one of you. Then who will you rip off? Conversion options become, became another way of sugarcoating these bonds. So what you're trying to do is add features to the bond to convince people buying the bond. Puttable bonds, another example. Convince people that they're going to be protected in the event of something like an LBO. Remember, you're not doing this because you want to do it, but because you have no choice. If you did not do this, people would be demanding these outlandishly high interest rates. They're saying, no, you, I know you don't trust us, so let's add these special features. So sugarcoating the bond is going to be much more of an issue if people don't trust you. They won't trust you because of your history. It might be because they can't see what your cash flows are, because you have intangible assets. All those things come into play in how much you sugarcoat these bonds. So you've designed the perfect bond, you've got the tax okay, you've got the different groups on your side, at least they're not pushing actively against you. You've sugarcoated the bond enough. Last step in the process, before you issue the bond, make sure you're not locking in market mistakes that work against you. Let me explain. Let's suppose you're a company with a triple B rating, but you think you should have a double A rating. You think you're a much stronger company than the ratings agencies of you in U.S. Let's say the right kind of bond for you is a 30-year fixed rate bond. So you get ready to issue the 30-year fixed rate bond. You should pause because if you issue the bond today, the coupon rate on the bond is going to be based upon that triple B rating, right? When in fact you should be paying a much lower interest rate. So rather than issue the bond, you might decide to issue a short-term bridge financing and try to convince the ratings agency that you're really a double A rated company. It might never work. But you don't want to lock in that high interest rate for the next 30 years. So if you have market mistakes that are working against you, don't lock them in. You see where I'm not going to go? What if you have a market mistake that's working in your favor? What would that be? Let's say that you really should be a triple B rated company, but I assign you a double A rating. Do you see what you're going to be tempted to do? You're going to go out and issue as much debt as you can, knowing that you're paying too low an interest rate. The bottom might fall out. We say, that's not my problem. It's a bond buyer's problem. That's what the telecom companies did in the late 90s. Every one of them, I'm convinced, knew that they were being overrated. But because they were overrated, they borrowed way too much money. You say, what's wrong with that? I mean, it's a market. I took advantage of it. What was wrong is they got the cash. They did not need the money. They just issued the debt to take advantage of this mispricing. And once they had the cash, they felt this urge to do really stupid things with the cash. Do you know the variant of this, uh, this market mistake working in your favor is? Eh? All these social media companies are trading at really high prices, right? Let's say the LinkedIn CEO calls you into his office, locks the door, makes sure that there are no microphones around, and he asks you a question. He says, you know what? I'm looking at my stock price, and I think we're way overpriced. Secretly, I think a lot of these social media guys know that their companies are overpriced. But then he puts you on the spot. You're my investment banker. Let me ask you a question. And let's let this be between the two of us. I know I'm vastly overpriced. Should I go out and issue as many shares as I can today to take advantage of the market mispricing? So let me put you on the spot. I'm the social media guy. I ask you this question. I know I'm overpriced. So this isn't even a question of, you know, could I be over... I think, I know I'm overpriced. Should I go out and issue more shares at this higher price? What's your answer to me going to be? Seems like a reasonable... I mean, it's a market after all. If people are paying that higher price, what's wrong with doing it? My advice is if you need the cash, do it. In fact, if you want to take investments and you need the cash, of course you could, should, should go out and raise money at this stock price. But if you don't need the cash, don't go there. And here's why. You issue these shares at the high price, people are going to buy these shares, right? They're implicitly trusting you on that. You know, so this is the price. And because you're, you know the stock is overpriced, you know what's eventually going to happen. The truth is going to come out, the stock price is going to collapse, right? So two years from now, when you're at the annual meeting, you're going to look across and you're going to see a room full of stockholders, two-thirds of whom bought the stock when it was really high-priced, and they're really pissed off at you now. 
I know it's tough to do for companies to hold back, to take it. You know, they want to take advantage of market mistakes, but this is a long-term, pro it's not a one-time game. If it was a one-time game, I'd say go out and play it, but it's a game that you've got to go back and play again. And the only thing, if you're a growth company that you have to offer is what? Credibility, right? Don't put it at risk because you want to take advantage of a market mistake now. So market mistakes that work against you, don't lock them in. Market mistakes in your favor, if you really need the cash, go out and raise the money. But if you don't, don't go overboard on it. So that's basically the process of designing debt. This is the summary of the previous five pages. So think about your company. Think about the perfect bond for your company and think out of the box. Don't think of what's already out there. Think about what you would design. This is why the company calls you in. Okay? Second, make sure you got the tax okay. Get it, get it to pass the tax. Third, you know, if you have different groups, your equity research analysts, ratings agencies, the regulatory authorities, see if you can design the bond to meet their different needs. Fourth, sugarcoat the bond if you have to. And only then are you going to issue the bond, but even there, be careful. You don't want to lock in market mistakes that work against you. This is not rocket science. Anybody can do it. It just requires a lot more work than looking in the product box and saying, this is it for you. Okay? So let's try to put this into practice. And I'm going to go through three different ways in which you can design the perfect bond for your company. I'll give you my preferred way. My preferred way here is actually qualitative. It's intuitive, rather than work through numbers. But for those of you who want some numbers, I'll give you a numbers-based approach. In fact, I'll give you two. First is an extension of capital budgeting, where you have the cash flows for the project. If you can give me the expected cash flows for a project or projects, I can actually tell you the right kind of debt for that project. And we'll talk about how that works. But if you don't have project-specific information, maybe there's something in the historical data on your company that I can use to design the right kind of debt for your company. So let's start with the intuitive approach. Let me take Disney, because that's my company of choice. And essentially try to design debt that's right for each of the different businesses of Disney. Let me start with studio entertainment, the movie business. A typical project in the movie business is likely to be short term, three years, maybe four years. For Disney, at least until very recently, it was primarily in US dollars. That's starting to change. Pirates of the Caribbean, I think, was one of the first movies that actually generated more revenues outside the US for Disney than it did inside. Okay? And the cash flows are very difficult to predict on movies. Movies have this very strange, skewed distribution. There are a few really big winners. And most movies actually lose money. I mean, that's why when you can get on Netflix and you see all these movies, like, when did that come out? I never saw that come out. Because they come and they go and nobody notices them. In fact, at the end of every summer, if you look at the big hits, the top 10 movies account for 90% of the box receipts, right? So it's a very skewed distribution. So I'd like to design the perfect bond for a movie business. It will likely be short term. For Disney, at least, it'll be in dollars. If it was, di it'd be different. If you produce action movies, I might have more of my debt be in foreign currencies. And if I could, I'd like to tie the coupon rate on the movie to how well the movie does. This is less of an issue for Disney because it's a gigantic entertainment company. But can you imagine being a small movie company with everything riding on a big budget movie? And let's take Lucasfilms. Must be tough to lose a Star Wars franchise, right? The guy's probably sorry, he wrote only six, you know, six, you know, six, uh, the six parts to the story. Let's say Lucasfilms, uh, George Lucas says, I'd like some more Star Wars cash flows. And he decides to make another episode. Let's make it a reality show built around Darth Vader or something. You know, they, you know, you follow him through the universe, the galaxies. As he takes a shower, as he you know, takes a shave, whatever he needs to do. But it's going to be a big budget movie. It's going to cost four hundred million. He comes to you, you're his investment banker, and says, "I'd like to borrow money to fund this movie, but I'm not really sure whether people want to watch Darth Vader all day in reality." Okay. So you design a bond. To fund this, it's going to be the Star Wars bond, right? It's going to be probably what three, five years. Star Wars franchises do last a long time. Probably multiple currencies because Star Wars is a global franchise. 
But here's the part where you might get creative. You might say, let me tie the coupon rate on this bond to how well this movie does. So the gate receipts are greater than 600 million. I'll pay 12%. If the gate receipts are between 400 and 600, I'll pay 8%. If they're less than between 200 and 400, I'll pay only 4%. If they're less than 200, I'll pay no interest. So who'd buy this bond? There's probably some Star Wars fanatic who says, I know the Star Wars franchise, so I'll bet on this bond. Don't be surprised at what people will buy. Okay? Have you heard of Bowie bonds? You know who David Bowie is, right? This guy's spiky hair. In fact, in the early 90s, David Bowie had a fight with his record company where he bought back the rights to all of his music, which left him with a cash flow problem. Rock star cash flow problem don't go together because how do you maintain the five houses and the six rows? So he decided to bundle all his music and raise cash flows against the revenues he would make on the music. So an investment banker in New York actually helped design that Bowie bond. And what made the Bowie bond unique was the coupon rate in the bond was tied to how many records he sold. This were done today, it would be iTunes songs that he sold, but in those days it was actual records. So if he sold five platinum records, the coupon rate would be 15%. If tomorrow we all woke up and said, David Bowie, who wants to listen to him? The coupon rate would drop to 0%. If David Bowie can do it, George Lucas can, right? Let's face it, the bond market would be a lot more interesting with Bowie bonds and Madonna bonds. They never mature. Elvis Presley bonds, they go on forever. I mean, you basically could have all these bonds floating around. Okay? In fact, to just close the story, there's an Italian soccer company that issued bonds to fund a stadium. I don't remember the name of the soccer team. And they'd actually gone from whatever the equivalent of Division I in Italian soccer was, Division II, so they were building the stadium. And they weren't sure whether they were going to end up staying in Division II, in which case the crowds would drop off, or go back to Division I, in which case the crowds would be much higher. They tied the coupon rate to how they would perform in the next season. Essentially, people have, what they're doing is they're taking equity risk and they're putting it into the bond. It's not the only way you can do it. We'll talk about alternatives. Maybe you can use derivatives. Maybe you, but this is a law. If you're exposed to a long-term risk and you can bring it into your bond, you're making those bonds less risky while preserving the tax benefits on the bond. Now, let's move on to the broadcasting business. Broadcasting business in, for Disney is still short-term, still primarily in dollars. Okay? So that high school musical get, gets the bulk of its revenue still in the US. And it's driven by ratings, not bond ratings, but Nielsen ratings. So if you were designing the perfect broadcasting bond, it'd be a rating sensitive bond, but probably a bond that's tied to the Nielsen ratings on the show. Okay? The theme parks are Disney's longest term projects. In fact, remember those 100 year bonds that Disney issued? This is the only business where that would make sense. Very long term. The cash flows, at least when I did this, were still primarily in US dollars, because Hong Kong Disney had not opened. But that's a bit of an illusion, even though it was in US dollars. If you looked at the breakdown of tourists coming into Orlando or Anaheim, a big chunk were foreign tourists, right? Latin American tourists, Brazilian tourists for Orlando, a lot of Asian tourists for, you know. You think, so what? Well. If the dollar strengthens, the number of people coming into your park, so even though everybody pays in dollars, you're still indirectly affected by exchange rate risk. And that would effectively mean that if I were issuing debt to fund Rio Disney, I would make it all reais, even though everybody pays in reais, because I'm hoping to get people from you know, Argentina, Venezuela, Peru. So my mix of currencies would reflect the mix of tourists that I see coming into this park. So when we talk about qualitative, that's what I'd like you to do. Take your company and think out of the box. Think about what a perfect bond for your company would look like given what it does as a company. Okay. So that's the first approach is to basically take your company apart, think in terms of the business, and think about the perfect kind of debt for it in terms of maturity, in terms of currency, in terms of you know, should it be straight debt or convertible debt, should it be fixed rate or floating rate debt. That's 90% of debt design. If you want to get creative and add something to the debt, go ahead and do it. This is a chance to think outside the box. Let's worry about whether there's a market for it after you've designed the bond. You know why you should do this? Because let's say you have a client, you designed the perfect bond. The client is a small client. Say, so no way can I 
get a market going. It's too small a bond issue. You set it aside. Then you have another client in the same business, and it looks like that same bond you designed for the first client would have worked for the second one as well. The, by the time the third or the fourth client comes in, you're saying, hey, maybe we should create this bond. And remember, that's the, the mother load for making money is if you can be innovative and create these securities where there's a need that exists that's not being filled, that's, you know, that's basically how you generate high profits from creating securities. Okay? So that's the first approach is to do it from the ground up, build up intuitively to the perfect kind of debt for your company. Here's the second approach. Let's say you're finding a really big project. And this works only if you have a really big project, because you don't want to take small projects and do it for each project. But if you have a really big project, you're saying, how should I fund this project? And you've done a capital budgeting analysis of the project. So you've done what we talked about, projected cash flows in the project. Here's a simple way in which you can take the cash flows you got from your capital budgeting and answer questions about what the right kind of debt for your company is. Okay? Let's take the Disney theme park. This is a, actually the cash flows I showed you when I did the capital budgeting. So basically we stopped in year 10, we came up with that big terminal value, and the net present value at the cost of capital was 2.877 billion. So until the third column, it looks like I'm doing exactly what I did in capital budgeting. In the last column, I'm going to do something strange. I'm going to take the present value and multiply it by whichever year the cash flow comes in. So I do this for each year. So basically 921 times 1 is 921. 729 times 2 is minus. So basically I take each year's cash flow and multiply by when I get it back. If I add that last column up, see I get 58,375. So what am I going to do with that? If you divide the 58,375 by 2,877, you know what you get? You get the duration of this project. This is how we compute the duration of a bond, right? You take the coupon payment, you multiply. This is the duration for the project, about 26 years. And what am I going to do with that? If I asked you how long term should my debt be to fund this theme park, you know what the, debt, the duration of the debt should be? Roughly 26 years. So by looking at a project's cash flows, I can tell you what currency I should issue the debt in, how long term the debt should be in, but this works only if you have all of the expected cash flows going out into the future. So if you divide 58,375 by 2877, I forget what the exact number is, that's going to be the duration you would use, not just for this project, but in terms of what kind of debt should I use to fund this project. So the perfect theme park debt would then reflect that duration for the bond, and I can then go on top of it and add on whether it should be fixed rate or floating rate, what currency it should be in based on what I see for the cash flows for this project. If you're in project financing, which is a big area of, of, of this, is, this is basically your job, right? Looking at a project, what's the right kind of debt, is use those same techniques we used in capital budgeting and extend them out and you should be able to tell me a lot of specifics about what the right debt for your particular project should be. But a company like Disney, I'm going to go crazy if I did this for every project, right? If you come to me with a movie and I say, take the cash flows. So here is the alternative to building this on a project by project basis. What I'm trying to do is take a company overall and say, is this company's debt right for it, right? And there's something I can learn from history. If I can tell you how this company's value has changed over time, year by year going back, let's say 30 years, as a function of how macroeconomic variables have shifted, interest rates, GDP, then maybe you can look at the tea leaves and say, in this company, this is the right kind of debt for the company. Sounds mysterious, but here's what I'm going to do for Disney. I'm going to look at two measures over time. The first is I'm going to look at the operating income for Disney over time. The ups and downs. And let's see, what, when, when does Disney do well? When does it do badly? And the second thing I'm going to look at is the total value for Disney as a company. Market value by equity plus debt minus cash every year going back as far as I can. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to look at history to get a sense of what, what, what is good for Disney. Is the interest rates high good for Disney? Interest rates low? How do exchange rates affect Disney? How cyclical is Disney by looking at the actual data? And here's the macroeconomic, here, so basically here's the historical data for Disney. You have the operating income going back to 1985. The firm value going back to 85. Don't worry, you don't have to go back that far for your companies. You can go back five, six. But the longer the time period you go back, the more, the richer your data becomes. Right? And I compute the percentage change in operating income and the percentage change in value each year. So negative number year basically means it was a bad year. 
a positive number means it was a great year. Right? So I'm going to take what happened at Disney from 65 through 2008, and I'm going to map it on against what, what, what the interest rates did, what GDP growth did, what the... So do you see what I'm trying to do though? I'm trying to see whether there's a pattern here, whether there are things happening at Disney that can be explained by what's happening to macroeconomic variables. And there are four variables I'm going to focus on. The first is the T-bond rate, the level of long-term interest risk-free rates. The second is the deflated GDP. You go on to the Federal Reserve website, they have a GDP in nominal terms. The deflated GDP, I'm just taking the inflation out of it. It's real growth in the economy. The third column is the CPI, that's the inflation rate. And the last column is a weighted dollar. I'm going to argue that by looking at how Disney does as a function of each of these four variables, I'm getting answers on what the right kind of debt for Disney should be. Okay? So here's the first thing I looked at. I looked at how much Disney's firm value and operating income change as a function of changes in interest rates. I'm going to argue that the answer to this question is going to tell me how long term Disney's debt should be. Sounds like two completely unrelated issues, right? Why would changes in Disney's value as a function of interest rates explain how long term the debt should be? Rather than going to abstractions, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you what the regression gave me. And then I'm going to try to read into the regression as much as I can. So here's what I did. I took, went back over time. I took the percentage change in Disney's value each year, which is about 30 years of data. And I regressed it against the percentage change in T-bond rates each year. T-statistic is not great. But see that minus 2.94? If I, if I believe that number, you know what it's telling me? Every 1% increase in interest rates reduces my value as a firm by 2.94%. We talked about duration and going about the long way by building it up from the cash flows. I'm going to argue that the, if you believe this regression, the duration for Disney's assets is about 3, 2.94 years. But that's not the way we've done duration. You're right. When we do bond duration, we do it the long way, right? We take the cash flows, the expected future cash flows. When we did the project duration, we did it the long way. This is a shortcut that tries to answer the same question. Because when you do the duration of a bond, here's what you're computing. You're looking at the percentage change in the price of the bond for a 1% change in interest rates. That's a way to think about the duration of a bond. That's exactly what I'm doing in this regression. For every 1% change in interest rates, how much does the value of Disney change as a company? So it's a different way of thinking about duration because rather than using projected cash flows, I'm using historical cash flows. You would never do that with a bond because you have the projected cash flows. But with a company, you might have no choice. Since you don't have the projected cash flows, you have to use the historical data. Okay? So if you think about what we're doing, the duration is the percentage change in value for a percentage change in interest rates. Traditional duration measures use the actual, ca the expected cash flows. I'm just using a regression to try to answer the same question. So the, if you believe that first regression, the duration of Disney's assets is about three years. File that away because that, if I believe that then, the duration for Disney's debt should also be three years. Any questions on the interest rate regression? Okay. Here's a second regression I decide to run. Oh, actually, before I go show you the second regression, I also checked to see how operating income at Disney, because remember, I have both measures, how the operating income at Disney changed as a function of changes in interest rates. And here I got actually a contradictory result. Remember, for every 1% increase in interest rates, the value of Disney decreased by about 3%. Every 1% increase in interest rates, the operating income at Disney actually goes up. How do I reconcile those two factors? How can operating income be going up and the firm value be going down when interest rates change. What are the things that go into firm value? The level of income. Okay. This, the discount rate you're going to apply to that cash flow and the growth rate, right? Let's say inflation goes up. Let's say my income goes up. What else is changing in the equation? The discount rate is also changing. It looks at least at Disney like the discount rate effect is dominating the income effect. The income goes up, but it doesn't go up by enough. So interest rates collectively, even though the operating income goes up, the firm value effect is going to dominate. That's going to be the duration that I use for my debt is what I get from that regression. Second variable I looked at was GDP growth. 
So when I run a regression of what your firm's income and value do as a function of GDP growth, you know what I'm trying to get an answer to? Is how much are you affected by economic cycles? How cyclical are you as a company? Rather than classify this based on qualitative variables, I'm looking at what you actually do. So in this case, if you look at this regression, you're trying to get some insight about, is my company a cyclical company? Why might that matter? If your company is a cyclical company, it might feed back into how much you decide to borrow as a company. How much protection you try to get against recessions, economic growth, all those components can then help you design better debt for your company. You think, you think Disney is a cyclical company? In fact, I don't, we could tell both stories. I've heard people say, hey, theme parks, people go to those theme parks in recessions because you promised your kid that. But rather than look at the stories, let's look at the actual numbers. If you look at the actual numbers, every 1% increase in GDP growth, my firm value increases by 8.89%, and my operating income increases by 6%. So high GDP growth is good for Disney, low GDP growth is bad for Disney. To the extent that I look at this regression, it looks to me like Disney is a cyclical company. If I'd had coefficients of zero, or close to zero on both of those, my conclusion is Disney is a non-cyclical company. If I got a negative coefficient, how would I read that? What does that tell me? It's a counter-cyclical company. It's a company that actually does well during a recession, which feeds back into how we think about betas too, right? So cyclicality, I'm just trying to get a measure of how cyclical you are by looking at your actual numbers as a company and how they change as the GDP changes. Then I looked at how Disney was affected by exchange rate changes. Again, this regression, I can get a positive coefficient, a zero coefficient, or a negative coefficient. A zero coefficient basically means I'm unaffected by exchange rates. Both a positive and a negative coefficient tell me that I'm affected by exchange rates, which means both a big positive and a, both, and a big negative number means I have to think about using foreign currency debt here. So we already told the story for Disney because it gets so many tourists from other countries when the dollar gets stronger, it should be negatively affected. Let's see if that holds up. Every 1% increase in the dollar, the strength of the dollar, reduces my firm value by about 2% and reduces my operating income by about 1.6%. The numbers seem to confirm the fact that Disney is affected negatively by a stronger dollar, which means if I'm designing debt for Disney, I want to see a lot of foreign currency debt there. Okay? Last regression, I looked at how Disney was affected by inflation. Why do I care about this? We talked about fixed versus floating rate debt. I said to use floating rate debt, you've got to be able to pass inflation through to your customers, right? In other words, I want to see a big positive coefficient on inflation for at least the operating income because that's what you use to make the interest payments. And when you look at Disney, that's exactly what you see. Every 1% increase in inflation, you see their operating income increased by 8.8% and their firm value increased by 2.71%. At least based on these numbers, it looks like Disney is a good candidate for floating rate debt. So if I were to trust across these regressions, here's what these four regressions tell me about Disney. First, the duration for Disney, Disney's debt should be about three years. Remember that coefficient on interest rates? Second, Disney is a cyclical company. I don't know how I'm going to decide to use it, but the debt choice I make should reflect that. Third, Disney is hurt by a stronger dollar, so I have to bring in some foreign currency debt. And finally, Disney does have pricing power, which might make the, the move towards floating rate debt more sensible for them. So when I look at Disney's balance sheet, I want to see a lot of foreign currency debt, a lot of floating rate debt. I want to see debt with a duration of roughly three years, but here's the catch. All of these regressions were based on about 30 years of data, and they were all noisy. I, I kind of glossed over this, but if you look at the T-statistics across these regressions, they're all very marginal. In other words, every one of these regressions, I'm getting a number, but I'm not sure about that number. In fact, this is a problem we ran into earlier, right, when we did betas. We said any one regression you can get any, and what was the solution there? How did we get around the problem that a beta regression was noisy? What, did, what are we using instead to get around the fact that an individual regression's beta is noisy? We use a bottom-up beta, sector average, right? So here's what I did. Rather than trust these four regressions for Disney, I ran these regressions across companies in the sector. Don't even try to do this. It was a pain in the neck. 
I do it once every five years. It took up an entire month for me to do this. So I don't even update it very often. I just change them the year on top. And I hope nobody notices. Okay. So basically, these are the sector averages for the four businesses that Disney's in. So I took the four businesses. So this is like a bottom-up beta, but I'm doing a bottom-up duration. The bottom-up duration is five years. You'll always have a negative sign because you, you value decreases as interest rates go up. GDP growth, it's, it, you know, it, it is cyclical. The average company in the business is cyclical. So across the four businesses, I look at bottom-up estimates of each of those. I trust these numbers more than the individual regression numbers. In fact, in your project, now I suggest you run the individual regression numbers, but then I also tell you after you run the regression numbers, don't get too phased by those numbers because you're going to replace them with sector averages. And I'll give you the sector averages by business because that is a more meaningful number to build your debt design around rather than take one regression and make that the driving force. So if you look across those companies, across the businesses that Disney's in, I would expect Disney's debt to have a duration of roughly five years, to have some, some protection against cyclicality, to be strongly driven by inflation. So I should have, should have a lot of floating rate debt and a substantial amount of foreign currency debt. And this is even before I look at Disney's debt. That's what I expect to see. What I actually saw, in fact, was a little different. So this is the part of the process where you design the perfect, what you think Disney's debt should be. It should be roughly five-year debt, a lot of floating rate debt, a lot of foreign currency debt. So I took a look at actual, the actual debt that Disney had. Disney's actual debt had a duration of, or a maturity of about 5.38 years. The duration was slightly less. What did I want it to have? Roughly five years. So in terms of duration at least, Disney seems to have the right kind of debt. You know what would have shocked me if I saw a, only short-term debt, one-year debt or 20-year debt, then you have a mismatch. But at least in terms of duration, Disney's debt looks okay. In terms of foreign currency debt, only about 10% of Disney's debt in 2009 was foreign currency debt, and it was all Japanese yen debt, which I think is a problem, because if you think about where the cash flows are coming from now, I would expect to see a lot more foreign currency debt, and a lot of it be not yen debt. Maybe even you know, Latin American currencies, European currencies, you don't see that. And Disney has no convertible debt, and about 24% of its debt is floating rate debt, which is high, but I would expect it to be even higher. So looking across the debt, the duration looks okay, but there doesn't seem to be enough foreign currency debt, and I don't think there's enough floating rate debt. Can I fix it? What's one way to work? I mean, let's think about the extreme way I can fix it. I can pay off all of this debt and replace it with new debt, right? And 30 years ago, that's the only way to do it. You'd have Today, though, you have two tools at your hand that you can use to fix this problem. One is you can use swaps. This is a legitimate use for swaps because in a swap, what do you do? You take your fixed rate US dollar debt and you replace it with floating rate euro debt of equivalent market value and you can do it overnight. The second is derivatives. You can use derivatives to get around some of the problems with conventional debt. So if you're thinking about swaps and derivatives as the place you're going to put, this is the contribution you make to corporate finance. And ultimately, that's the value added in the process. So at least in the case of Disney, the ways you can get to the debt, there are lots of different ways you can do it, but in terms of, you know, in terms of choices, we have a lot more. Here's the other way you can get back into sync. If you have a lot of new projects you're planning and new debt you're going to issue, by using a disproportionately large amount of floating rate debt and foreign currency debt to fund those projects, you can bring your overall debt back into sync. So you can either adjust the existing debt using derivatives and swaps, or you can issue a lot of new debt to bring yourself back to where you need to be. So when you look at your company, okay, here's what I'd suggest. Even before, so don't look at the debt that the company has yet. Think about what you'd like to see your company hold, for how long-term foreign currency debt or, figure, or domestic currency debt, fixed rate or floating rate debt. Then look at what your company actually has, and if there's a mismatch, start thinking about how you can get that mismatch to go away. Those of you who work in emerging markets or plan to work in emerging markets, this is a huge area of opportunity for you. You know what? Until about five or 10 years ago, if you're an Indian or Brazilian company borrowing money, what were your choices? You went to the bank, and the bank said, I'll lend you money on a two-year loan. He said, I'd like a 20-year loan. The bank said, no, we don't lend on 20 years. I'd like a fixed rate loan. No, we only do fixed, you know, you know, floating rate. 
you were stuck with whatever banks offered you. So if you look at a lot of Indian, Brazilian, a lot of emerging market companies, you look at what's on the balance sheet, it doesn't match up to what they should have. Today, those companies have choices they did not have five or ten years ago. That's why I think it's a huge area of opportunity for somebody to step in and say, this is the right kind of debt for you. Let me get you back into sync. Okay, so let's stop there. And if you get a chance, please get the optimal debt ratio at least done for your company. Uh, I have a company in the UK, but I don't have the lease. Yeah. Professor UK, if I log you out. How do I make that screen come up? So basically, what they're doing is just catching up with taxes they deferred in earlier years, so they didn't turn back. How do I log in? Did you make an announcement at the beginning of class? Yeah. Okay. See, was it control all delete? Um, so how do I, how do I uh, change the screen? All right, I don't want to waste you guys' time, so let's just get let's get this started. All right, um, right now the academic committee this year has been working on trying to adopt a grade non-disclosure policy to bring up to the MBA current MBA one class and our future MBA one class for vote. Um, what this means. Uh, to start is our current grant disclosure policy is that you just can't put your GPA on your resume. Besides that, everyone gets to find out what your grades are. Uh, what would a grade non-disclosure policy would mean would mean that students during on-campus recruiting 
or actually during their entire time they're here at NYU Stern, would not put, give any sort of recruiters or companies their grades. However, as soon as you get a full-time offer, you, you probably will have to give your grades, as well as once you graduate, you'll probably be expected to provide your grades as well. It's only while you're here at school. A bunch of the top programs have grade non disclosure policies, Booth, Haas, Columbia, Stanford. And then um, there's also a couple schools that have administrative-led grade non disclosure policies where it's the professors, the administrators are the ones that have implemented for the school, uh, Yale being one of the, the most prestigious. However, a bunch of schools don't have it as well, MIT being one of the top ones, Tuck, as well as uh, Kellogg. So we kind of had a quick meeting to try to discuss what the pros and cons of grade on disclosure. So on the recruiting side, uh, in talking to students at other schools, it's they find that the interviews are much more technical because they're trying to figure out who actually knows the material with those who don't. So the, the con is that for people who haven't been in that industry before, uh, it creates a major problem for them for those interviews. A lot more preparation to take place. Also, without uh, access to grades, interviewers do spend a little more time trying to get to know the students. However, like everything in the school and throughout the process, interviewers and companies are going to rank us somehow or the other. So these are going to be through grades, or it's going to be through GMAT, or some other metric. So we're not getting rid of metrics on how companies will evaluate us. It just won't be using grades. Um, next is a lot of top schools have great and disclosure policies. We consider ourselves a top school, but we only recently have broken into the top 10, top 11 right now. So really, do we have the reputation yet with the managing directors and the hiring managers of these firms to adopt a great non-disclosure? And lastly, just everyone's tracking, green eye disclosure does not mean your grades are hidden forever, just for the 24 months you're at Stern. Additional pros and cons for the classroom experience. Theoretically, people can take classes they want and not worry about grades. They might be uh, slightly better prepared because they're, not, so they're studying the things they don't know and uh, concentrating on the things they do know. However, the con is that kids might start blowing off class. If you don't have to talk about your grades, then you may not do anything to care about your grades, which really will diminish the classroom experience for everyone. We've all been in classes where no one read the case, and then we don't get anything out of that class. And then um, additionally, uh, for Stern's reputation, it could boost it. We can get better students coming to school with a higher yield rate, because they know they don't have to give out the grades. Or also could hurt us, because it could negatively affect that students aren't as prepared coming out of school for companies as they would if when they had to, had, when they had to give out their grades. And then uh, second question is, would it enhance the collaborative nature of CERN? And on that note, do you guys think it's even a problem? Do you think the school's uncollaborative? So this is the proposal that will most likely be voted, will go up to the student body here in the next few weeks. Um, first of all, uh, for the voting, the voting will be done in two parts in order for it to be adopted. First part will be the current MBA ones. We have to have a 75% participation rate in the vote with 75% voting approval. A non-vote is considered a no vote. If we get that 75% participation rate with the 75% approval for the MBA ones, then for the class of 2014, when they get here in the fall, they will vote as well. And if they also give us 75% participation with the 75% yes, then the grade, then grade non-disclosure will be implemented for the school until a class determines they don't want it. What does, what does that mean, then? It means that students cannot disclose their Stern GPA, the individual course grades, or any grades received in a course, including their midterms, to an employer until they've accepted a full-time offer for the time they are Stern students. Enforcement is the hardest part. It's going to be on the honor system. That's why we need a 75% participation rate, 75% yes. Um, egregious offenders will be referred to student enforcement. Not 100% sure what that means, but they will go to the judicial committee, most likely. 
and they can help make decisions on that. And then um, employers who do ask for your grades uh, will be uh, reported to OCD, which will talk to them about it. And then if approved, we'll start it in the, for the fall 2012 recruiting. All right, any questions? No idea. Next question. And we don't really have a way for us to get back to you on that. That's, we just don't. We've done a lot of research, and most schools aren't really forthcoming about their policies. And they're, they change from year to year, because a lot of student bodies will adjust what the policies are each year. And let's say we got the data. I, well, also, I think that there's um, different schools have different grading. Uh, th the question was, how many schools have the curve policy, like Stern does? So basically, there's other schools that have grading policies that are just different than ours. Like they have um, like different levels, or maybe only like a very small sliver of the class can be like considered like an honor student, and that they can report. But otherwise, like everybody just kind of falls into like a general body, and it's so it's hard to compare and do apples to apples. But um, I think Stern's policy is actually somewhat more lenient than some other schools. But um, you know, it wouldn't change. Nothing about the policy would change the current grading system. Yeah, we, uh, we've talked to OCD about it. OCD doesn't want to bring it up to the recruiters because they don't want the recruiters to have any input on it. Uh, basically, OCD thinks recruiters probably won't really care, but they can't promise us that, and they're not going to do a, a poll. Also, a lot of the other schools um, already have the policy in place, so a lot of the recruiters are already used to not being able to ask about grades. So if it was a policy that we put into place, it would be like respectfully kind of adhered to. At least that's what the amendment is. Yeah. They won't ask. 